Welcome to Jammin' with Jason Mefford, a show where we discuss topics relevant to chief audit executives and professionals in audit, risk, and compliance. We discuss the technical and soft skills needed to navigate the minefields of organizations. You hear best practices and practical advice for helping you advance your career, and we'll even talk about music, mindfulness, and psychology, because we can. So sit back and relax while you listen to the number one podcast in the world for internal auditors, unscripted and unedited. Well, hi, everybody. I'm Jason Mefford, and I am pleased to be talking to Rick Wright today. And Rick is the Chief Audit Executive of YRC Worldwide, uh, which is a transportation company based in Kansas City, Missouri. And uh, I'm excited to talk to Rick because I, I talked with him before and found out he is writing a book on agile auditing. And I know this is a topic that a lot of people are interested in. And uh, so just want to really kind of jump in and get started with it. So Rick, thanks. Thanks for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's, um, you know, as I've, when, when I first heard the term agile auditing, you know, I, I kind of thought, okay, I know what agile is, right? Because, because IT has been using this methodology for a while, but it's really kind of about project management, right? And so at first I thought, well, why are we, why would we be doing that as auditors? And then as I got to thinking about it, it makes total sense, right? So, so maybe just kind of explain to people what's kind of the 30,000 foot view of what agile auditing is. And then we can start kind of talking about, you know, how that means, you know, uh, what that means for us in changing and how we do audits going forward. Sure. Uh, I think one of the first things that, you need to do when talking about the subject of agile auditing is, you know, define what do we mean by agile auditing mm -hmm. I think within the internal audit community. Um, people have a lot of different ideas about what that actually means. So you have kind of the one, uh, you know, camp where agile auditing is, you know, being more nimble, um, being able to address risk, uh, more timely and more relevant fashion and really uh, about you know how to audit uh, in a more lean manner um, more efficient um, really just doing audit better uh, that's kind of one uh, line of thinking about what agile auditing means the other uh, camp of agile uh, auditing and the one that I'm focused on is utilizing the agile software development methodologies um, and values and principles that are outlined in the manifesto for uh, agile software development um, and, and using that structure and, and kind of retrofitting the audit process around uh, that structure. And uh, what, what I'm finding is I'm, I'm writing my book and, and researching and implementing agile in my own audit function is that Scrum methodology, which is uh, an, an agile software development methodology, is kind of the methodology of choice for um, building this agile auditing uh, process and approach around. So that's kind of the first, I think, distinction and in, in, in information that you need when you're, you're uh, talking about and learning about agile auditing is just, you know, what, what do we mean? Yeah. So hopefully that gives a little bit of of uh, uh, color around that is the second part is really around uh, a, a mindset shift um, related to um, how you approach an internal audit. You know the the traditional waterfall approach where you have a planning phase uh, and, and where that encompasses really planning out the um, the entire um, path of the audit up front and then going through a field work or execution phase uh, when, when that's complete, going through a review and reporting stage, and then you know finally closing and uh, wrapping up the audit. That is kind of the traditional way that audit has been done. With Agile, um, you're, you're, you're really looking at it from a very different mindset approach. So it's a uh, very much more of a collaborative, uh, a lot of value seen in and collaboration between audit clients and and uh, 
uh, the audit team. So whereas in traditional uh, audit approaches, there's more of a, I guess, kind of an arm's length type of relationship that's uh, really inherently uh, built into that process with Agile, um, the audit client really is invited more to be a part of the audit team. Um, so there, there's a very uh, different mindset around um, how the, the relationship with the audit client is established and, and managed throughout the project. Uh, there's also um, you know, the, just the, the flow of the audit is very, very different. Instead of planning everything up front um, like it's done in the traditional uh, approach in Agile, the, the work is done on a more iterative, incremental basis. So you work in time boxed uh, uh, work cycles that referred to as sprints, and uh, they can run anywhere from a week long to four weeks long, but that, that time frame is set. And within that, there is a, a distinct planning, execution, review, and reporting phase. So it's just, uh, in some regards a little bit like a mini audit. Um, but it's very, very focused on the activities that will be performed in that particular time box work cycle. And then um, when that is complete and the next cycle starts and that planning, uh, execution, review, reporting process uh, continues throughout the uh, the audit until um, the objectives of the audit are achieved. So that, that uh, is uh, kind of in a nutshell the um, approach and, and how we define agile auditing is how I'm defining agile auditing. Yeah. Well, no, and I, and I think, you know, the, there were a couple of really important points that you brought up there because, um, you know, first, let's just talk about the the meaning for a little bit because, you know, I, I see this a lot when I'm talking to people about different things, especially things like risk management, where there's so many different understandings or levels of what risk management is that a lot of times you're just completely talking about two different things. And so, like you said, you know, agile auditing, some people see it as, well, you know, I'm more nimble, I'm more fast, you know, in, in how I'm doing it versus others that are looking at, no, agile auditing is actually using, right, this methodology. Uh, and, and, and those are two different things because, because one, one group might say, well, yeah, I'm, I'm agile in my auditing because I, uh, I don't have a three-year locked-in plan, Right. But that's not really agile <laughs> processes put into into place, right? So I can see where there, there's there's some maybe misunderstanding of of some departments might say, yeah, we're doing agile, but they're only thinking of it in in like being nimble versus you, where you're actually utilizing and incorporating the actual methodology, right? And I love, like you said, Scrum is probably the most popular, and I love that term anyway, just because I'm kind of. <laughs> I think they have, isn't it, Scrum Master? And I thought, man, that would be like a great certification to get, you know. Um, so, 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 yeah, I mean, there is kind of this difference between the two, right? And, and so how, how do we, if you're actually using the methodology, like you said, I think there's some fundamental differences in how we do the audit, right? So under an Agile method, how do you do, for example, annual planning? Yeah, that's a, a great question. And from you know a risk assessment standpoint, um, you know that process is uh, I don't know that it changes a whole lot. You, you still and with, with an agile methodology, um, you, you still do risk assessment um, and, and you can do that um, according to your normal cadence that, that you do it if it's an annual, uh, process, you, you know, you can, you can, that works within the Agile framework. If it's a more frequent uh, time frame that, that works also. I think the, the distinguishing factor there is, um, and, and every organization is going to be a little bit different in, in how they execute that, but with Agile, generally what I have seen is that organizations have a much um, shorter time frame of their, their audit plan. So I've seen uh, kind of a, a three plus nine where uh, three months worth of uh, the audit plan is is scheduled out and, and you know what you're going to be working on for that three month period. And then there's a, a nine month kind of backlog mm -hmm. of other potential audit projects, uh, but you don't know if, if those are going to be projects that you actually get to or not um, when, when that three month um, 
uh, you know, kind of set on a plan is, is complete, then, then you create the next three months. So it's that not that nine months is kind of a trailing um, audit plan, and uh, it, it is um, refreshed on a uh, essentially a three month mm-hmm. uh, timeline. And um, you know that that's kind of how I think organizations tend to think through the the agile auditing audit plan not uh, in, in the traditional annual process, but more in a kind of uh, a rolling um, uh, tentative type of uh, um, audit plan. So uh, that allows an organization to be a little bit more nimble, um, allows an organization to be more relevant in the projects that it selects based off of risks that the organization is facing um, at the current time. Mm-hmm. Well, and it is, you know, that, that I think is one of these mindset shifts because, you know, traditionally an audit, you know, like you said, we'd create an annual audit plan. Um, some, some departments would actually do a three year plan. So not only did they plan kind of the first year, but, you know, for some rotational or other things like that, what they were expecting to do, you know, in the second and third year. And as, as businesses change, cause I remember, I remember being in a group with, um, I think it was at one of the conferences that I was at and some people from Google uh, were talking and you know, about how they do their, their, their planning. And like you said, it's kind of like, like this three plus nine that you just mentioned. Um, And and I remember the person from Google saying, you know, we can't create a year, a year long plan because we have no idea what our business is going to look like even three months from now. And so for them to try to get locked into you know, for sure what they're going to do for the whole year wasn't possible for them. And, and, and I almost think it's really not possible for, for everybody, but it's, it's, it's a big mindset shift in going, you know, like what you might analogize to an annual budget process to doing a rolling forecast. And um, I, th- I think that's kind of what I'm, I'm hearing you saying. Is that, is that kind of right? Where we create more like a, a three month forecast with some, some ideas of what the next nine months might be, but those are going to change as we maybe get to the end of the three months. Yeah, no, I think that's a good a good analogy uh, to go with there. And I, I think most audit uh, functions, most contemporary audit functions now, or even doing you know an audit plan, they they might you know you know create an, an annual plan of projects. So I think most organizations are on a, a you know either quarterly or or biannual, and some even even uh, more frequent than that, um, doing some kind of some form of refresh, whether you're using agile or not. I think most organizations have gotten to the point now where they are doing some kind of a refresh of their audit plan throughout the year, which is a, a good thing. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, the agile framework, the agile process, really lends itself well um, to a, a uh, more dynamic type of uh, audit plan as opposed to static. Well, and as, as, as you've kind of transitioned there in your organization, um, because one of the, one of the things that I hear from people is kind of a pushback sometimes is they say, well, you know, the, the standards kind of say we're supposed to do an annual plan. I can't even remember off the top of my head if it says annual or if people are, are inferring that. Um, and you know, the audit committee is used to us presenting our annual plan. So how does that change? you know, going forward and, and were there any discussions that you had with your audit committee where they were like, well, we want to know what you're going to do for the whole year. Or, you know, was that an easy transition to make to say, look, this is really what we're going to focus on for three months. We think we're going to do these other things, but don't hold us to it. Um, what, what was kind of that transition that you had as you've been making this change? So for us, that transition wasn't difficult because even before we started doing agile, that was our mindset with our, our plan. And you know, you know, part of the beauty of uh, the the standards for internal auditing is that they're principles based; they're not prescriptive. So you can present an annual plan if if that's what you want to do, but there is you know nothing that says that that has to be a, a static you know, mandatory, you have to do these projects in your annual plan. So there's, you know, the, the principles-based nature of uh, audit standards uh, uh, provides a lot of discretion for the audit function and how they want to, um, you know, maneuver around that, that annual plan that they put together, if indeed it is an annual plan. 
Okay. Well, and then, and then let's, so, so, so the, that's kind of from an annual planning perspective. Now let's, let's think about it from the engagement level, because again, I think this is where some of the bigger changes are, you know, and brings in, like you talked about more collaboration with the audit client where traditionally that may not have been the case, but I, I, I personally think that's really important. And, and this methodology allows more collaboration and really partnering with, with, with the management team. Um, but how does it look different now on, on, um, on the engagement level? And, and, and where I'm going to go from is, you know, a lot of people, and I remember I sent one of my, when I, when I was a chief audit executive, I, I remember sending one of my staff people to a training. And she came back and said, well, the instructor said every uh, engagement is supposed to be four weeks. One week of planning, two weeks of field work, one week of wrap up. You know, and, and even then I was like, no, that's not how you do it. Right. It's not every audit is four weeks. Um, there's a planning phase, there's a doing phase, there's a wrapping up phase, but it's not four weeks. But I think tradition, you know, a lot of people still kind of think in, in some of that kind of a mindset, right? That we're going to spend a, a certain fixed time doing planning up front. Um, and maybe in traditional, that was much more time than what it is now under an agile approach. So how, how does maybe explain a little bit about how, how does an engagement look uh, when you're doing it under the agile methodology? Right. So with agile and, and you know, not to say that you know, collaboration hasn't been a part of, um, you know, the audit process. Collaboration is always part of the audit process, whether you're using, you know, an agile uh, methodology or you know, more of a traditional methodology. I think the distinction is that um, with uh, agile auditing, collaboration is built into the design. So it is inherently a part of the project and the process mm -hmm. by definition uh, within agile. So to me, that, that's kind of a distinguishing uh, characteristic there. But in terms of how an agile audit um, looks kind of from a process standpoint, and how it's different, it's much more uh, iterative. So um, you know, we've all done audits and, and, you know, gone through the planning and felt like we've had a, a rock solid plan, very well thought out. Um, and, you know, it doesn't take too long often to get into <laughs> the, the trenches and, and, the, you know, the, the field work phase and realize that things come up, you learn new things, mm -hmm. um, you find new things and, and those uh, can sometimes change the whole direction of the audit and, and make the planning, um, you know, kind of irrelevant at that point in time. So, and, and you can kind of get, get stuck there. There's a point where you get to, and you're like, wow, we need to go back and do more planning now. Mm -hmm. Well, audit kind of takes that, that off the table, or, or I'm sorry, agile takes that off the table. Um, what we do in agile is we start with a, an initial uh, planning phase and um, we're not, uh, interested in planning out the whole audit. We're more focused on, you know, what's the scope? What are the the main themes of the audit, uh, the, the general objectives that we want to achieve out of the audit? Um, and from the, the business owner standpoint, what are their, their concerns and what are the issues that um, are already known? Um, we also want to look at, you know, what's the value that we're going to get out of the audit, make sure we really understand the value proposition of the audit, so we're we're thinking more high level, more what is is going to what's the definition of a successful audit here, um, and not the the you know specifics about how we're going to go out and test and you know what are the controls that we're going to be focused on. Um, we can learn all that later. Mm -hmm. So that first initial um, planning is um, uh, high level. It, it's an initial plan. The expectation is that um, you know. The plan is going to change as the project progresses. So that that is, um, you know, something that, that is um, a, an expectation that is entered into at the outset of the project. And then once you get, you know, past that initial phase, then you go into these time box work cycle uh, elements of the project, again, referred to as sprints. And we use two-week sprints, as I mentioned. Typically, you're going to see one to four weeks. But 
from my experience, most organizations that are doing agile audit are, are using two-week sprints. And so within that two-week sprint, you have a number of um, what we call ceremonies in the Scrum world. And ceremonies are just uh, meetings that, that serve a purpose to help direct the, the progress of the, of the project. So there is a, a sprint planning uh, ceremony that is focused on planning out just that two-week uh, uh, sprint, the work that will be done, um, and the tasks that will be performed for that. So that, that is the field work for that, that two weeks. So there is a, um, at the end of it, there is a review ceremony where the, the work that has been done is reviewed to ensure that it meets the, the goals of that particular sprint, um, that the work that was done meets uh, established acceptance criteria that has been agreed upon between the audit team and the um, audit client. Um, and then there is a process for presenting the, the work that was done, the conclusions that the audit team has reached with the uh, audit client and, and other stakeholders. And so it kind of, it's kind of a reporting mechanism. And the value there is that um, everybody gets on the same page. So the audit client um, has an opportunity to challenge uh, results of the work at that point in time. Um, it it uh, uh, kind of keeps everybody from getting to the end of the, the audit and realizing, you know, oh, there's a disconnect here. Mm -hmm. Everybody's on the same page within that two week time box. and um, reporting is is done there so that the audit client can go ahead and start working on uh, their responses to any observations, issues, findings that were made in that particular two-week sprint. So, um, And then uh, when that sprint is done, that cycle starts up again, um, and that continues until um, all the objectives of the, the audit are achieved and uh, uh, you know, then there's a wrap-up phase and, and a final reporting phase. So um, that's uh, the, the difference. You have these these ongoing cycles of, of plan, uh, field work, and reporting um, that are done in these two-week increments. Um, and you know, planning can be as new things are learned. Mm -hmm. um, you can you know, shift gears, so to speak, um, not have to um, you know, try to force you know, a plan that was developed before all these other learnings were were made on uh, onto the project going forward or waste that time. Yeah. Well, and so that, so that brings up a couple of questions for me then too. So just maybe so that the people that are listening can get an idea. Let's um, from, from the initial, that initial planning. So maybe let's say under, we'll just call it traditional method, right? Maybe that planning phase took a week or two weeks. Um, how, how much time would an agile initial planning be? I mean, would that be a few days or would it still be a week or how, how does the time maybe differ, um, under an agile, at least for the initial planning? And then we'll jump more into the engagement here and shortly. Yeah. So that, that's an interesting question. My, my experience has been that, you know, planning in a traditional audit can, can take a, a pretty significant amount of the resources within yeah. Uh, the audit and you know what what you know I've experienced in the past and um, you know other organizations and that I've you know uh, been in with audit groups is that 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 planning you know it, it can kind of take on a life of its own and you get to a point where you know just kind of plan every little detail and just goes <laughs> on and on and on. <laughs> yeah. So um, you know ideally, yeah, that that would be you know a, a one or two week process in the traditional audit sense. Um, but my, my experience has been that, uh, you know, it, it can run a little bit over that. Um, with, with Agile, again, you're focused on just, you know, what, what, what's, what's the important, you know, what, what's the most important uh, to get out of the audit project? And what are the main objectives? What are the, um, the, the, the key, you know, what's the value proposition for the project, making sure that, you know, Everyone's on the same page with what the, the ultimate goal of, of the audit um, is to be, and they're not focused on you know the details. That's safe for later. So that you know uh, inherently you know reduces the uh, the time that's needed for that, that initial planning. The the other uh, piece of that is the the documentation that is required is. Um, uh, 
significantly less in our approach and, and most other organizations that I've benchmarked with uh, Agile Audit. It's a one-page planning document that's created, and it's it's a you know, very summarized uh, type of format, um, so it doesn't get into a, a lot of great detail. Um, again, it's focused on what really matters in terms of directing guidance and guidance for the overall project without getting into core details. Yeah. Of that. So, in, in my experience, um, you know, getting to your question, um, you know, that initial plan uh, for an agile audit, you know, could take a couple of days, um, up to about a week. Um, if you're spending more than that, um, I would I would question: Are you getting you know, too much into the details, too much into the weeds of of the project? You really should be able to, uh, you know, plan out. They create that initial plan for a project, you know, in you know a couple of days to a, a week's worth of time. Mm-hmm. Well, and 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 as you're talking, it makes I mean, you know, traditionally we would have yes, we do the planning, we come up with the objectives of the audit, right, and the scope, and but but then we would start to like you said, you know, understand what's going on. So we start coming up with the work programs and the everything else, you know, in that initial planning phase often which is easy for it to, to go, like you said, you know, two weeks, three weeks, sometimes maybe even four weeks, depending on the size of the project. And, and it starts getting out of control because we're spending all of our time planning and not actually doing the work, right? Which, which is one of the benefits of, of Agile. Um, and so to me, it, it sounds like, you know, kind of what, you, what you're saying here is the, the, we're not going to get into the details yet in the planning, but we have to be very clear on exactly what the objectives of the audit are. That that's the important thing. Then we de- we document them in like this one page planning document, um, and then we start doing these these sprints to be able to help us then you know dig in deeper to make sure that we are accomplishing those objectives. Because as I was listening to you talk about you know the the sprints and you know kind of following the progress and everything yeah. else. At first, my mind kind of went to scope creep, <laughs> you know, like, oh, instead of, you know, spending four weeks in planning, now we're just going to keep doing these sprint after sprint after sprint after sprint and never end up accomplishing, you know, the, 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 the project. But, but I guess the, the point is, if you're crystal clear on your objectives when you're planning, then you're going to kind of know when you're done, Right. Right, right, and and that that really is. And I don't want to say that there's no detail planning. There's you know some detail planning. It's just you know done done you know a level higher than what it's done in a, a more traditional audit. So you you know the general um, areas that you're going to dive into, um, but you're you're not you know building test plans and, and tasks and. Things like that, but it's a it's a very iterative process by design, and so you know you, you do um, you know you do your initial plan, and then once you enter into your sprints, you're doing more micro planning for you know a particular subset of you know the work that's going to be done throughout the audit, um, and you know coming out of the initial plan, you generally have uh, a sense for you know the number of sprints that it's going to take to complete the project. Because you know, you know the, the general areas that are going to be, um, you know, worked on, you know, tested, researched, um, learned about. Um, so it's 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 very iterative in nature. So you do an iterative plan. You you do do the work associated with that plan. You do iterative, you know, review and reporting, um, and then you reset. You you look at the, the work that has been done. You look at the learnings that have been made. And then you you go back and look at the objectives, and if there's a reset that needs to be done, you have an opportunity to reset at that point. So you're you're making these kind of micro adjustments uh, to the the project as you go along, um, and uh, you know in, in that way you can correct course earlier on in the process instead of getting to the end of the project uh, before you realize that you know you're way off base off of you know what was really important in the project. Mm-hmm. Um, cause you didn't know what you didn't know at the beginning. Well, and, and, and that's where I, I see a lot of the benefit coming from is, is having those, those sprints, you know, and like you said, you have these, these ceremonies, you know, at the beginning or end and, and you're reporting 
um, you know, more timely, kind of like, you know, again, what we've normally would have talked about is interim reporting on a longer project, but, but the process forces you to actually do it, you know, mm -hmm. you know, organizations that were doing this anyway, it, it's not going to be a big surprise, but a lot of times, cause it wasn't baked into the process. Um, a lot of times that some of that interim reporting may have, may have not been as, as formalized as, as it should be, where this is kind of forcing it to happen. Right. Um, so, so, so I can see that as, as being a really, you know, positive, um, because like you said, if, if you don't, you don't get down the road four or five weeks and realize that, you know, you just wasted half of that time. You're, you're, because it's iterative, you're able to change and modify what you're doing as you're going through. Uh, which which can have some huge huge time savings, but also you know more effective if if you're focused more on making sure that the objectives are done instead of you know a big work program that you developed in a in an earlier phase everything's ticked off right because like you said as you get into the project I mean we all know this I mean this happens every time no matter how good you plan up front you get into the project and you find out things and so then stuff changes. Right. Um, and, and this is just kind of helping to systematize, um, some of that as you're going through, <coughs> excuse me. So, so with this, then I guess with more kind of interim reporting, how does that change maybe the way, or, or does it change the way that the final audit report, um, is actually issued? So that's a great question. Um, you know, the, again, the, iterative nature of how the project is um, you know, completed does allow for interim reporting, um, allows the uh, audit client to start crafting their uh, responses and their action plans and to potentially even you know, you know, complete uh, a remediation effort or, or complete you know, a response to a particular risk that's identified or not being uh, managed uh, as effectively as it could be. So, you know, ideally, um, you know, as the sprints are completed, as, uh, you know, the, the uh, observations are being communicated, you know, that report is kind of building off of itself. So after sprint one, you have, you know, a, a piece of the report that is essentially done. After mm -hmm. sprint two, um, you have another piece of that. So um, you have, you know, kind of a report that, that you start with, and as the project goes, just build onto that based off of the um, you know, work that is done throughout the various sprints so that when you get to the, the end of the, the audit, the last sprint, um, you should have a report that is more or less done, yeah. um, including, including action plans, which, as we all know, um, a lot of times can be one of the most time-consuming aspects of wrapping up an audit is getting the action plans from uh, the audit client mm -hmm. um, and, and working through those. So the, the process helps to make that uh, the, the reporting more efficient um, uh, and you know, uh, helps the, the audit client to um, also kind of keep pace with that and, and not have to uh, you know, work on their action plans at, at the end of the project. They can be working on that throughout the project as the project progresses. So from a reporting standpoint, there's a lot of uh, efficiency that can be gained. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, there's, you know, it, it, it creates a much more timely response. So, you know, I'm sure we've all had audit projects that have uh, lingered on, you know, perhaps longer than, um, they, they should have lingered on and you get to the end of it and some of the observations that you made um, are no longer relevant even. Um, <laughs> yeah. because of other changes that have happened yeah. in the business. This, this prevents that from happening and, and it uh, you know, allows a more immediate uh, response to risk. So you know, there's not a risk that's hanging out there that the company continues to be exposed to. Um, management will go ahead and start working on uh, responses to those. Yeah. Well, and, and I like that because like you said, from the action plan, if, if you're, if you're touching, you know, touching base or kind of connecting in with people, you know, throughout these sprints, it allows management to start working on the action plan before you get to the end of the audit, which is great. Because one of the things I always like to do is in our final report, I love to be able to say something like this, right? 
we, you know, there's 10 or 20 different things that the client's trying to do. And five of those were done and completed before we even issue the report. Right. And so it allows, that would kind of give them kudos to management of, Hey, you know, this group is on top of it. They've actually fixed these problems before the report even got issued. And so it, it would allow more of that kind of, um, I guess, positive reinforcement because you're, you're giving them time to work on it. You've already agreed on it. You're not fighting about it, you know, at the end in a closing, <laughs> closing meeting, and then you're rushing off to get on a plane or whatever else. Right. And then you're, you're trying to deal with some of the inefficiencies of working through some of those things on phone calls or emails as well. So, um, yeah. And I, and I like that idea that if you're, if you're doing this right and following the methodology, you're actually writing your report as you go along. So when you get to the end, report writing shouldn't be this huge ordeal um, like it has been in the past. So that sounds great. So um, so uh, just, just a couple quick things in here too that kind of tie into this and then we'll try to wrap up. Um, but, but was trying to think too, you know, as far as the auditors on your team, and, and because again, we said this is kind of a mindset shift. And, and so what things have you had to do maybe to kind of prepare your team to switch and kind of follow into this, this new agile mindset and methodology? Another great question. So um, what I typically find with organizations is that as I mentioned, you know, at the beginning of the call, there's there's some auditors, you know, audit staff that um, are are a little hesitant. That they they wonder about, you know, uh, com conforming with standards, and those are all really really good, you know, things to make sure that are are covered. Um, and then you have the the kind of the other side of the uh, the house where. Um, you know, people love change and, and love trying new things, and, and this is kind of invigorating for them. So, you know, there's a change management piece that goes into this as it goes into any any kind of organizational change. Um, you need to recognize that some people are going to be uncomfortable with this and help them through that. Um, Agile does not um, contradict standards. Agile um, you know, still checks all the boxes with um, you know, internal auditing standards, so there, there really isn't any concern. There are differences in how standards are um, conformed with, mm -hmm. um, uh, but at the end of the day, there, there's nothing about agile audit that is in conflict with standards. So it's, it's a matter of convincing the staff, showing them how you know standards can still be complied with in this. Uh, new way of, of doing audits. Another thing that's really important and, and a big change with Agile is there is a, a huge trust component that is built into it, and it comes from you know the, the values and principles of, of Agile me methodology. And so there's this idea of self-governing and self-organizing teams within the Agile framework. <laughs> so. Um, the the audit team um, really is, is uh, the the group that dictates how the audit work gets done. Um, you don't have uh, you know an audit manager, an audit director, chief audit executive dictating to the audit team how the work is going to get done. You set the objectives, you identify the value proposition, um, you you outline the the components of work that need to get done, and then you let the audit team do the work, and you let them do it the way that they think um, is the best way to do it. Um, now, that doesn't mean that it's just a free for all. Um, obviously, there, there's checkpoints and and uh, you know places where work gets reviewed and things like that. But as the, the work is taking place in sprints, the the uh, audit team. It are the ones that are determining how that work is going to get done, how that objective is going to get uh, be achieved, um, how that value proposition is, is going to be realized. Um, and, and that's, for a lot of people, that is uh, a refreshing approach, but it does take some getting used to, you know, being, being empowered to that extent. And there are some people that really embrace that, and there are other people who, um, you know, 
like more structure and, and like, you know, more being kind of told what to do mm-hmm. along the way. But that is another another aspect of, of change uh, that needs to be managed in, in the project. Um, but, it, you know, as far as, uh, you know, the, the audit staff and, and preparing them for for the transition, you know, th- those are probably the two biggest things that, that I would say. Um, most organizations that I've talked with and in, even with my own organization, once they get into, you know, the, the prints and they get through kind of the initial, initial um you know, learning about of the process, they, they really embrace it and they really enjoy uh, working this way uh, much more than, you know, the traditional model. And, and uh, you know, once, once they've done a couple audits, they're sold and they never want to go back to the, the traditional way of doing audits again. Yeah. Well, which I think is interesting because like you said, it does, it does require more of this self-managed, <laughs> self-governing, you know, kind of uh, mentality, which again is not, has not traditionally been there in audit, right? I mean, we've, we've tended to be very hierarchical, you know, even in the staffing of the engagement, right? You've got a, you know, maybe you need a couple of staff people and one senior and one manager and then the CAE, right? And so there's kind of this hierarchy of, you know, getting the approvals and, you know, the reviews and all that kind of stuff where now we're, we're turning much more of that over into these self-managed teams, which, goes with human behavior as far as how most people would prefer to work. Uh, you know, like you mentioned, though, there are some people that prefer to be told what to do instead of being self-managed. Um, and so you have to kind of draw them out to that. But especially younger generations um, are much more, seem much more willing to and wanting of kind of this self-managed um, t- type of an arrangement anyway. So, so I guess kind of a follow on question on that is, does that end up then changing kind of the structure of who is in the audit department, the level of people in the audit department going forward? You know, because if, if we kind of move away from the traditional hierarchical, you know, I've got three staff people and one senior and, and the manager on an engagement how does that maybe look going going forward and does that mean we're going to have to change kind of the, the, the structure of our of our um, uh, departments yeah that that's a fantastic question and I think it's something that um, audit groups that have implemented agile are wrestling with right now because it does change the hierarchy it makes it a much flatter yeah. organization um, within you know, the, the Scrum framework, there are, um, you know, essentially three roles. There's a, a, a product owner role, which um, oftentimes is the audit client, uh, but sometimes it can be an, an audit you know, kind of leader role. Um, and then there is a Scrum master, which serves as sort of a project manager. Uh, they, they are a person who um, is uh, very familiar with Scrum methodology, and they're um, you know, purpose is to ensure that the audit team uh, essentially stays true to the Scrum methodology, that they, they work through the, the uh, ceremonies that um, are required of, of Scrum, that uh, they, they, they follow the methodology essentially. And, and they're also there to ensure that, you know, impediments, any impediments or uh, uh, blockages that come up within the project are, are dealt with. Um, and then there's the the audit team, um, and the the audit team consists of uh, you know the audit staff, and you know even clients can be part of the audit team. Um, they are the ones that are going to be doing the you know actual work of testing and and uh, uh, you know what we would traditionally view as the the field work, um, mm-hmm. and and they're participating in um, you know planning activities up front as well, <clears throat> but. Um, yeah, it, it does kind of challenge the traditional, you know, model of you know, staff auditor, senior auditor, audit manager, audit director, chief audit executive. It challenges that hierarchy and and how that works. And um, I think that again, that that is a a question that uh, audit shops that are doing agile agile are still working through and. And uh, trying to figure out how um, how to address going forward. As far as you know, uh, from a competency standpoint, 
you know, one of the things that, um, you know, I've had to think through with, with my team is, um, you know, it, it is because of the self-governing nature of it. You need uh, individuals who are, are comfortable in that type of environment um, that uh, are very creative, uh, uh, very good critical thinkers, uh, problem solvers. Um, and, you know, I, I've also found that, you know, the soft skills are really, really important. Not that they, you know, aren't in the traditional sense. Obviously, they are. But those soft skills really come into play just because it is a, a by design, a collaborative uh, exercise, both with the audit team members and with the uh, audit client as well. So those soft skills become very important. Um, I have found that, you know, a some process improvement background is, is really good because Agile does lend itself um, to consulting projects very, very well. Mm -hmm. And so that, that skill set is important. Um, it lends itself to um, data analytics as well. So that skill set, I think, is, is heightened even more than it already is. Um, obviously, the, the traditional you know, audit skills are, are still important, but I think it, it does change um, a little bit uh, the makeup of the competencies that you're you're looking for uh, along the lines of uh, you know what I just outlined. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, obviously, there are there are changes that are going to be coming, and like you said, companies that are going down this path don't have all the answers yet, <laughs> but mm -hmm. you know, start starting to make some some inroads there because like you said, I mean, and I've seen this over and over again, that the importance of these soft skills uh, is even more important now than it's ever been. Um, because yeah, it's hard to have a self-managed team that's collaborating more frequently with others in the organization if they don't have the soft skills, you know, because mm -hmm. it, it just, it just doesn't work. The relationship issues, uh, you, you know, you have, you have trouble with. And, and like you said, you know, I mean, if you think about the, these three roles, right, the owner, the master, the team kind of a thing that, um, you know, again, some of the people on the staff, for example, may need to, you know, be trained more in, you know, being a scrum master and actually having, you know, I'm just kind of spitballing here a little bit, but, you know, Maybe we hire project managers, right? People with project management skills, maybe a PMP who is, you know, trained in agile and experience and being a scrum master. Maybe that's a new role that ends up, you know, in the audit departments that historically hasn't necessarily been there, right? To kind of fill, fill some of that position. Who knows, right? We, we, we got to learn. It's an iterative process too, right? The transitioning to agile auditing is also an iterative process. Uh, yeah, and you know, some of the, the organizations that I've benchmarked with, you know, they are, um, some of them hiring Scrum Masters, and some of them are sending their people to Scrum Master training so that they, um, you know, can function in that particular role. One other thought I had on, you know, the uh, kind of the, the competencies associated with, you know, the audit staff. Um, I focus more, you know, kind of the staff level people do doing the work, but there's also a definite um, transition that needs to take place in the way that audit leadership thinks about how um, an agile audit uh, function should be led and, and managed because, again, with the self-governing uh, concept, you know, there's a lot of a lot of trust that has to go into that. So. You know, the old command and control type of leadership structure really is counterintuitive to how an agile audit uh, function uh, needs to work. And so audit leadership also needs to go through a transition in the way that they think about, you know, how the organization is uh, uh, managed and, and how it is led, because um, there, there are definitely some dynamics there that, um, uh, you know, kind of turn uh, you know, the hierarchy upside down as well. Yeah. Well, definitely changes ahead and, uh, you know, both in the competencies as well as kind of the way that we are doing, um, the audits, but yeah, I think, um, this is, this is one of the concepts that's going to be here, uh, in the future. <laughs> and so, you know, again, um, if you don't understand agile, hopefully after listening to this, people under, at least understanding the concept a little bit more and now can kind of jump in and, and try to figure out how to make it work at their organization. 
So, um, Rick, thanks for, for coming on with me. Now, I know, you know, we made a little reference to the book that you're writing. Um, any, any kind of foreshadowing of that? Any ex expectations for when that might be available that we can go out and get your book and read through it? Yeah, so the, the uh, targeted uh, date for publication is uh, sometime around July of uh, this year, 2019. Okay. Uh, we were, uh, and it's, uh, it's, this is a project with um, the uh, IIA. Okay. Um, so the, the plan was to release at the international conference. Um, so that's kind of what we're shooting for, but uh, we'll see if uh, we can meet that, that target. But sometime uh, around the July timeframe, it should be available. If it's not um, you know, out there, there will be pre-sales that, that are going uh, on it. And uh, just as you know, a little bit of, you know how the book is structured. There is a uh, kind of the main part of the 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 book that talks about what agile is and, and explains the value proposition and uh, you know kind of the uh, um, nuts and bolts of of how to execute. And uh, to me, the, you know, part of the what I'm uh, probably most excited about the book is there are four case studies of organizations who are actually um, using this methodology currently. And uh, it goes into kind of the details and the story and the journey that they went through. Um, so readers will be able to <clears throat> kind of step into to the shoes of some other folks who have already uh, blazed the trail, uh, so to speak. And, uh, you know, it's already faced some of the challenges and, and uh, you know, gained some lessons learned uh, from their experiences. And so that, that will uh, be an opportunity to share. Uh, those with uh, the readers of the book as well, but uh, it, it's got a very it's got a very practical side, uh, you know, kind of how to nuts and bolts, um, as well as the you know, kind of case for um, you know uh, why why you should think about doing it as well. All right, well, excited. I'm excited to actually get the book and be able to see. And like you said, those those case studies um, are always really helpful for people because you know if as they're getting ready to embark on it, they can kind of see what other people have done and. I always like that because I'd prefer not to make the same mistakes other people make. <laughs> hey, you know, but uh, so excited, excited to have that out. And uh, Rick, thanks again uh, for talking with me today and uh, explaining a little bit more about what agile auditing is. All right. My pleasure. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks. And that's a wrap. Thanks for listening to today's episode of Jamming with Jason. Keep on rocking in the audit world. Have a great rest of your day, and I'll catch you later on the next show. If you'd like to earn continuing professional education for listening to today's episode, head on over to C Risk Academy at ondemand.criskacademy.com. And that's C as in the letter C, riskacademy.com. Not only do you get a CPE certificate, but you also will have access to the video version of today's show. The views and opinions expressed on this show are that of the individuals and not of their respective organizations.